I was born in 1975 to a loving, caring, idealistic mom, abandoned by a selfish father and stuck dealing with an alcoholic stepdad. And luckily too, I've taken on all what's good from my mom, though sometimes being very overly idealistic has been a curse for me in its own way. Because you know, the real world does not work that way. Then I met what I thought was the most beautiful woman in the world. We had four awesome, crazy, wonderful kids who are my life. Then evil crept in, though it was actually there for a while and I chose to ignore it because, hey, I was married to that most beautiful person. It came in the form of manipulation, greed, narcissism, you name it. All the stuff you see playing out in the world. Luckily, I was actually smart enough to get a divorce. And you might be thinking, hey, there's always two sides to a story. Well, on my side, I was guilty of being way too unrealistic, way too simple-minded, and just way so blindly in love because I always thought no one could ever love me because I was already married to that beautiful person. Well, two things could have happened. Yeah, it was that bad enough that I would have done it. I wanted to do it. I could have just ended. And I came close. But I think I was just a coward or stupid or both. Lo and behold, Somehow, luck hit me again from somewhere. I was given just enough courage to pick up, leave, and go find myself. Of course, I told my kids I'd be back. And yeah, I know I'm not that unique of a person for this to be happening to. I realize there has to be millions and billions of people that go through this who think, why me? As soon as this all finished percolating through my head, I decided to leave. For the sake of my kids, I had to leave. But I was coming back. My voice tends to put people to sleep, I noticed. And I realize that that's a good thing. Maybe not a sexy thing, but a good thing. I think it kind of weeds people out and shows those who are more genuine, you know? And we end up being friends. I mean, who wouldn't want that? They listen well. They care more and just have good emotional intelligence. I think, at least. I wish schools, parents, friends, or the universe could teach emotional intelligence. But it's impossible, because it's only words that can be said to someone who wants to understand or thinks they understand. Or it's that motivational thing you hear that might last for a little while before it wears off. Emotional intelligence is so important, just like self-awareness. 
Maybe you're probably trying to figure it out now. Sure, just research it, study it, and try it. It's either really easy or really hard, depending on who and what you are. But you know what can help? Go by yourself, travel and visit other cultures, acclimate, eat their food, be curious. Technically, it's a selfish reason, but this is a good selfish. Or easier yet, gear up and go out, drive somewhere, just remote enough and far enough from home. Camp, stay out at night by the fire, not a hotel. Maybe with the right friends, but maybe again by yourself. You'll meet yourself if you do it often enough. My meeting was in Big Sur. It's the central California coast from Carmel to San Simeon, but it's more than just Highway 1 and tourist spots. It's Deep Sur when you include the Santa Lucia Mountains and the Los Padres Forest. I'm not going to tell you where Deep Sur is exactly, but I'll say what it is. It's where the day skies and the starry nights and the vast white cap ocean and coastline and the mountain range and the clean air and the loud quietness and your sanity and it's all in one singular view, all of the universe's divine creations in one easy place with you in the middle. If you welcome this universe and know your position is minuscule in a gigantic way, then you're on your way to being okay. And that's the start to knowing from within and not to run away from things and make excuses. You just step away, regroup, and get back to it so you can keep coming back healthy in your head and your heart and body and soul. So you keep exploring. Before my personal trials and tribulations, I considered myself an artist, like many people I've met who work normal, regular jobs. It means to me that we were all carefree and creative before we had to grow up into this complicated and complex world and not get much out of it because it's a top-heavy system. And I, like many, had the added layer of marital bliss that turned to piss. And I drank it willfully because family always comes first before yourself, right? And you want to do the right thing because it feels wrong Otherwise, especially with kids. He's, he's awesome. Whenever he was like in third grade or something, right. he drew SpongeBob from the TV. He pop, fucking paused it and drew SpongeBob and Patrick, like exactly. <laughs> and he took it to school and was showing kids at school, and they're like, no, nah, you traced it. <laughs> I'm like, fuck. So he already had a natural talent for it. Man, all of my kids are all so. They're like me. They're not artistic in only just one way. Like, right. Paul's a natural musician. Definitely. Yeah. Like, he plays better than I've ever been able to. Um, yeah, so he draws. He, he's a musician. The he's creative. So that you guys are now inspiring each other. Yeah, no, that's super cool. I love it. 
Phil is a chef. Among many things, she draws to you. Patient, yeah. What's that say? Don't worry about, or don't worry about blinking. Don't worry about blinking. Don't think about it. Think what? Fuck, that's where that comes from. Jesus Christ. What? My stepdad. He used, to, say that? he used to talk shit to me when I was little. He'd be like, you don't blink, do you? <laughs> that boy, he used to say, you don't blink, do you? Why, he noticed like, you, you were a blinker? You don't blink, do you? And I'm like, fucking... <laughs> yeah, I blink. <laughs> Why did he say that? Because he's a fucking asshole. <laughs> he's giving me shit about not fucking blinking. That's fucked up. Any day now, think I'm on my way down, looking for a safe house where I can find my head. Any day now, think I'm gonna break down. Hope you don't see me. Well, my trek to California was also wistful, being away from my kids and my personal oppression. It wasn't until my next few trips that I really discovered Deep Sur and rediscovered the longings of my core desires and meanings in my life, which have never ever wavered. It just got buried, and because I'm an artist, like you, I dream, you dream, I'm thoughtful, you're thoughtful, I'm sad, you're happy, and vice versa. And more so, I'm a family man, which is my main calling. It's my main calling because it's why I work hard and will do anything so my kids can be happy and feel supported and loved. That it only took me 20 years to realize it could actually be a calling. After I kept asking, what do I want to do or be? It was in fact that I already had the ends. It was the means I needed to do. So if you can care for something more than yourself, or do something for the good beyond yourself, that's the first golden ticket. It's so very simple and yet so very complex. It's complex if you're caught in the man's vicious cycle, and if you don't know, then you are. It's complex when you're selfish and you don't know you are. You don't listen, though you think you are. You give, but it's a score to you. You know only what you're capable of thinking. In its worst case, it's absurd, nonsensical divisiveness. It should never be you against me or me against you. Now, if you've loved and equally loved back, then it's simple. Just love. Just love back. Just love back. When you love back, you love yourself, or at the least, you convince yourself eventually, like I did. It's like exercising or dieting. It takes practice and practice and practice. Love isn't lazy. I mean, you're what we've been built to do, and that goes for most of us. We're dream beings and love beings. Just gotta remind yourself every day, even if you don't need reminding. My second golden ticket, which makes me whole, is just being a creative person, an artist, a person who sees and feels color and space and thoughts and dark and light, and to make it a tangible slice to show off my contribution as a human. It's a very lucky thing to be able to do, and I try to see it in almost everyone I meet because we're all creative in some way. And so what should happen in between everything that is all the dark matter is more selfish curiosity because you want to see who else might be like you out there 
and what you can learn from them that could add more to what you already do, because interaction should never end. And you do it because you just care, because souls need to be fed. You care for others, and you care to listen and just keep learning. All that corny, cliché stuff is true. Actually, about every cliché is true. Too true, it's out of fashion, I guess. In Deep Sur, it's too out there to be in fashion. Well, except for a few. Because it's starting to get a little harder to find my spots. But the higher you go, the lonelier it is. And ironically, I equally love to be alone, to feel insignificant, so to still feel alive and grateful. Again, not to run away from the rat race or hide from anything, but to go more into the dark, to regenerate and steal more courage and connect with the vastness. Yeah, so the vastness of specifically Big Sur and the stars out here at night kind of has just opened up all kinds of possibilities and just having, being in and having this open space available is just, I mean, creativity can be endless when there's no boundaries. I think a lot of people call the same thing, the same thing, God, Allah, the universe. It's all the commonalities are something that's bigger than us. It's more than human, uh, bigger than anything that we can be or conceive. And my dad was kind of just like provided for like the first eight years and then he split. But he would like he would show up every now and then, like uh, eighth grade graduation. He'd show up, you know, mm -hmm. make an appearance. That's but that's about it. Oh. Well, m my father was a provider, a really good provider. So we always had what we needed. But he wasn't a caretaker, and he was a violent man. So he was uh, he had a temper. And then you know my stepdad being abusive, alcoholic, you know, just whipping me with a belt across my back was enough. After that, for a few years, we tried to develop a relationship and it kind of went well for a minute, but then it all just deteriorated again. Oh. You know, you're not angry. There, there's not, I'm not angry, but there's not a connection, you know, like, uh, like um, some of my friends have with their fathers, you know? Mm-hmm, yeah. As I got older, I observed how my dad um, reacted to conflict. And the way he always reacted to conflict was to get in people's faces. I think uh, when I was younger, I never thought that that was a bad way to react. It was embarrassing sometimes because you're out in public, right? And then here's your dad going off. Um, so there was that aspect of it. But also, I thought that, okay, well, that's the way you behave. That's the way you react. But he was a great... Um, provider. That's all he knew, you know. He was, he was a child that was, uh, whose parents uh, were not there for him. His, he didn't have a dad growing up 
leaving home and, and being brought up by his uncle. And his uncle in that town that he lived in was essentially the uh, law enforcer. And I don't even know if he was like an official town sheriff or anything like that, but he carried a gun and he put everybody in check and killed people. And so that was the example he had, the example for being a man, right? And so I don't blame him 100% because that's all he knew, right? Mm -hmm. But he definitely regrets it now, you know? He talks about some of the re his regrets and, and um, a lot of them have to do with how he expressed, you know, we should be men. So how, how has that shaped your, your look at, your view of how a daddy should react? Well, <laughs> I consider myself fatherless. Oh, wow. Yeah, because neither one of them des deserve enough respect to have that title. Mm -hmm. That notion of a higher power for a lot of people can be freeing. However, for me, I think a lot of belief just puts bookends on everything and puts everything in a box. Belief and bookends and boxes. Now, I resent that, you know? And so it's always been hard for me to, to kind of forgive my dad, you know, for instilling those values in me, right? When he could have taught me to be a peaceful person. Luckily, I had my mom that was uh, the opposite, right? She was, so, she was the, uh, the person that was a caretaker. And so as I started learning that fucking violence doesn't answer, you know, doesn't solve uh, uh, problems, I started resorting to how my mom uh, uh, cared for us and using that as my example to treat people, and it totally changed my life. I'm more connected to my mom. My mom provided when he wasn't there. Really? My mom figured it out. I had two really great examples of what not to be like. Now, to date, all four of my kids have validated me mm -hmm. in one way or the other, told me, like, That's right. Mm -hmm. Good job, Dad. I, I practice uh, Catholicism, and I always refer to myself as a Catholic by association, right, because I didn't necessarily have a choice in the matter. You know, something that I thought of a long time ago, like, I, I don't know, was raised in church and like went on like mission trips when I was younger and it was like, you know, I had this like, I'm gonna go save the world, you know, I, I wanna do something good for the world. And I've opted to continue practicing it, especially after my mom passed away, it gave me a connection to her. So in my mind, religion is uh, rituals that I can practice that honors my mother's uh, morality that she taught me. You grow up and you realize like a lot of the things that, you know, there's. Charity to me is like, it's just weird. I think it's like an easy way for people to feel better about themselves. But it's like, if you're happy, you can only do so much for other people. And if they're not happy, if they choose not to be happy, or if they just, if they just don't get it, if they're not ready to receive that, then there's nothing you can do. So like really the best thing that you can do for the world is to be one person happier. <laughs> Make the world just one person happier by being happy and taking the time to really think about what it is that like you, you believe in and you figure out how to apply it and like put it into to practice. Cause that's like, you know, every, everybody's a good person. Everybody has all these like, you know, all these morals and whatnot, but like so much of it doesn't really actually translate into like your daily life. Be natural. We act on what we believe the truth is, not what the truth actually is. I'm learning how to be happy. <laughs> I'm learning how to like be, be satisfied and be, you know, fulfilled. And I'm learning how to, maybe I'm unlearning how, how to, you know, a whole lot of things that I've been conditioned to, to think about myself. We shouldn't, we shouldn't be living life so complicated. It's not natural. Always being worried about what other people want. It's like, it's in my bones, man that the way we live is not natural, right? And I'm not talking about, you know, comparing the way we lived 100 years ago or 10,000 years ago, but I mean our connection with, with spirituality. My family and like always, always being there for, for your family, for, 
you know, your friends and you can't just cut these people off. And it, but it's like, I, sometimes you have to. Because we can have the technology in front of us and still have uh, the consciousness to say, you know, I, I, I believe in this higher being or I believe in this higher existence or this alternative existence. Yeah, it's, it's kind of selfish. It's sort of one of the most selfish things I've done, but it's like the only time ever I've actually just been like, no, I, I need this. I need it or I'm going to die. I'm just not going to be, I'll, I'll just like, just dissolve into a puddle of misery and like just slip off into the ocean or whatever. I don't know. We were, we were at awe because we saw this curve right here. Yeah, it's been there right. since the beginning of time. I mean, since the beginning of this planet. And we have the opportunity to fucking ex experience and express that awe just by looking at that, you know, that's a moment right there. And it's, it's not complicated. It's just there. To me, emotional intelligence is having the ability to be empathetic towards people, like everybody. Give praise. Um, some people, sometimes you think that they don't deserve empathy, but... You're real. Hurting people hurt people, so... You forgive. You gotta be able to put yourself in someone else's shoes and have enough emotional intelligence to at least, at minimum, just not judge them. One of the problems I have with Big Sur is people just don't appreciate it and take care of it. Not only in Big Sur, everywhere in nature, from the beaches of Hawaii to the mountains in Colorado, garbage everywhere and trash and diapers. That's why I don't want thousands and thousands of people out here in my spots. You guys probably remember like the commercials from the 70s with, oh. uh, with uh, trash being thrown out and shit like that. Oh yeah, and they had that, with, that with Native that American. Native American, speaker. yeah, and mm -hmm. they throw their trash out with, with everything the tears around. It's the same shit, it's just a different time. Because nobody's gonna take care of it like I do. Like me and my buddies, we have our, our moral standard for any campsite. Whenever we camp there and we're off the grid, we leave it cleaner than what we came. We're taking out garbage all the time. With the pollution in the trash here, I think it's actually um, a result of the popularity of people wanting to be outdoors, right? And I think that popularity is coming around because of uh, this period of time that we've experienced being uh, tied down to technology. It happens so many pla other places around the country every single year because of negligence and ignorance and lack of respect for nature. Yeah, you're right. It probably hasn't changed. <laughs> it's probably it's probably this idealistic view that we, we might have that because time has has progressed that we expect things to get better. We don't want some idiot coming out here and letting their campfire get out of control and burn down the forest and then my happy place is gone. Now people, I think, are starting to kind of experiment along that spectrum of life between technology and nature. And they're trying to explore, you know, what's probably the balance. That's why I think you see a lot of people now coming outdoors. So out of my selfish reasons and love for this place, that's why I don't want a lot of people out here. But I believe that everybody should get out in nature and have some kind of experience where they're pushed to the very edge of their comfort zone. Safely, of course, but to the edge. And then they really see what they're capable of. It's a blessing because People are actually appreciating it, but, right. but they don't know how to take care of it. I, I don't know if it's because technology is pretty clean and it takes care of itself. <laughs> that people have kind of lost sight of how to take care of something that needs caring. Um, I, I, I can't fight it. I can't fight the sense of um, caring for people or caring for nature. Into the stars at night. And I feel so alive, so alive. And you and I take to the sky.
skies too high It's where I want to die I think people are afraid of the dark because it's kind of like the unknown it kind of ties back in with the bookends of humans kind of needing or wanting to know so the darkness, what's, the where something starts and where something ends and in the dark you can't keep it out of the hotel. So you either have to trust your instincts and trust that you know the place, all of it, or the further you just outside your lost. comfort zone, the more you can grow and expand and learn. I've learned so much about myself by coming out here and spending hours in the and dark I feel alone. So alive that I want to die. It's when you and I start to
back in the day, I used to eat my uh, my jalapeno just with like sandwiches. Fresh or, or pickles? Fresh. No, fresh, fresh. I like yeah, the fresh yeah, ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but pickles okay. I don't have a problem with pickle ones, but I like the fresh ones. Because the pickles. It kind of takes away a little bit. Yeah, it kind of makes it little, milder. It takes away a little bit, yeah. but yeah, I like the fresh ones. I want to uh, make tacos. I like to put fresh ones on it. Yeah. And um, but the serranos are, are off the hook. But one time, um, when I was in the world, I got a uh, um, uh, the uh, the habaneros, right? And mm-hmm. the guys, I was in the halfway house. The guys were like, "Hey, you like these? Want to try these habaneros?" And I was like, "Man, I, I eat." I eat jalapenos all day long, like, like it ain't shit. They say it's the simple things in life are all you need. And all you should want. And all we should have. It's easy to disagree with this when you have everything. And your life is probably pretty luxurious if you really, really think about it. Like out here, it's simple. Even though we still have the quote-unquote luxuries of life out here, even when we backpack, actually. But the simplest things are intangible and invaluable and, interestingly enough, the hardest to comprehend sometimes. Meaning, if you look at something or someone, are you really looking at them? If you listen to something or someone, are you really listening? I like could think habaneros and jalapenos could affect lives so much. Take cooking, a perfect example of simple joy and sharing and collaborating and eating. Not rushing through it, but enjoying the entire process from creation to savoring and even to cleaning. It's a lost art. Why is something like this a lost art? Because we have to work harder, work faster, take care of more things, keep up with the latest, and everything that's in between are the simple things that go by the wayside. Except when you're out here, at least we try to retain that art of the meal. Simple, enjoyable, and surprisingly profound. Why else are things so complicated? Well, it starts when people say you have to be focused. Be disciplined, be goal-oriented, be successful, be this, be that. But you know what? That's all about just yourself. It's okay, but it's still all about yourself. You got to have some balance at least. I took you to the Lake Pocket, where I was raving about it. 
What about the art of conversation? This is different. You know why? The art of friendship. The art of reaching out. The art of just being lost with your friends and loved ones. In the simplest elements of life, there's, I mean, the simplest elements of the universe are hydrogen and helium, right? Three quarters of the unfathomable universe is still made up of it. And from it, look what's been created for us, every animate and inanimate thing ever. That's mine and Kayla's rule, the cook doesn't do the dishes. And we still only know a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of it. So why do so many of us, as humans, live with so much complexity, and so much we think we need, and so much we think we know? Well, I don't know. I only know if you focus on the simple things in life that bring you meaning, and you do it to the best of your ability, you can start to experience it. So what is it? Well, I don't know that either, but I know what it isn't. It's not just your truth or opinion. It's not just your ideology or beliefs or your wants or needs or your desires and secrets. It's beyond you as it should be. And in the art of finding it, even if you don't find your it, it will find you. Should it help so? We are help so.